Thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank Pastor John for the opportunity to speak with you again this week as we continue the series Words of Comfort from the Book of Psalms. You know, the shortest chapter in all of the Bible is Psalm 117. It only contains two verses. It's actually the middle chapter of the Bible as well, with 594 chapters before it and 594 chapters after it. If you really want to impress your friends, tell them that you have memorized an entire chapter of the Bible, and then just memorize Psalm 117 because it only has two verses. Interestingly, just a couple chapters later, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It has 176 verses in it. If you really want to impress your friends, try memorizing that one. But the very next chapter, after Psalm 119, after the longest chapter in the Bible, the very next chapter, Psalm 120, begins a section of 15 psalms that we often call the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 120 through 134. And today I want to introduce you to these psalms as we continue our series called Words of Comfort. You know, one of my favorite hobbies is hiking, especially in the mountains of our national parks. When you hike in the mountains, you can see some incredible views. You can feel a sense of accomplishment when you get up to a reasonable height and you get to see all of this beautiful stuff that God has created for us. Last October, I visited Turkey and Greece, and one morning I got up early and I hiked by myself up on a steep hill to a Greek village called Santorini. A photo that I took myself from that high vantage point is this one. I, I was just struck by the natural beauty that God had created in this beautiful Greek village. But I'll tell you, when you hike in the mountains, on the negative side, Climbing can be a dangerous thing. You might slip and fall. You get tired. Sometimes you probably wonder if it's worth the effort to keep on climbing. When I got up here in Santorini to this beautiful spot, I realized that I could have paid some money and taken a donkey up the hill. Maybe that would have been a little bit easier if I had ridden a donkey. Then I wouldn't have had to work so hard to get up there. But all things considered, I was glad I made the effort and I hiked up the hill. Now, hiking helps us appreciate the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 120 through 134. These 15 Psalms could be called climbing songs. They are called Psalms of Ascent because of several reasons. One is in Jerusalem, there were 15 steps that led up to the temple where people came to worship. So the song leaders would stand on these 15 steps and the Jewish tradition connected these 15 psalms with those 15 steps. But also, you have to understand, in altitude, Jerusalem was the highest city in Israel. The Bible says that worshipers went up to Jerusalem. They ascended the hills to get to Jerusalem and they would sing these 15 songs when they climbed the hills to attend the great feasts like Passover or Pentecost. It's just like we have certain songs that we sing in certain times of the year, like Christmas time. There are certain songs that we always sing. Well, the Jewish people sang these songs as they climbed the hills on their way to the holy city. Remember a time, maybe you've heard this Bible story, when Jesus was 12 years old and Mary and Joseph took him up to Jerusalem so that their family could celebrate the Passover? It's easy to picture Jesus and this group of travelers singing these songs as they ascended up the hills to go to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, when Jesus was 33 years old, a number of years later, he climbed those same hills to go to Jerusalem again. But this time he was going up there to be crucified on the hill that we call Golgotha or Calvary. Climbing to Jerusalem, you see, it sort of illustrates what it's like for all of us in life. We're on a journey with God. God is our hiking partner as we make the journey, and we all have to keep climbing. The Apostle Paul called it the upward call of God. Now, maybe all this is new to you. 
You might be just seeking to know whether or not you really believe in God, but you're looking for answers. That's okay. We're glad you're with us today. Maybe you're a new believer and you're excited about this climb, this journey that you're on, and you're eager to find out what your next step is with the Lord. Or maybe you've been a believer in the Lord for many years, but now God is calling you to climb higher, to take another step. But no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, if you're like me, you've probably learned that there are a lot of things that tend to knock you down in life. A lot of things that knock you down. And if you try to climb higher, just as you start to climb and take that next step, it seems like something else knocks you down. Maybe things have really been knocking you down lately. Well, I love this verse from Proverbs. The Bible says the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. So when life knocks you down, the Lord wants to help you get back on your feet and keep climbing. That's why today I want to highlight some key verses in these Psalms of Ascent that show us seven truths to know about God, even when life is knocking you down. What are seven key things that we can learn from these 15 chapters? Obviously, we're not going to cover every verse, but I want to hit some highlights as I introduce you to these great chapters of God's Word. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is when you are knocked down by life is that God will always tell you the truth. That is a pick-me-up to know that God is always going to be honest with you. Don't you get tired of people not being honest, of not knowing who to believe or what to believe? I don't know about you, but for me, lies just wear me down. Phoniness and dishonesty are exhausted. But the Bible says in Psalms 120, save me, Lord, from lying lips. And that's what God does. God gives us truth to save us from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. Maybe you're wondering these days, can you trust politicians and preachers and salespeople to tell you the truth? I got a headache when I was traveling, so I found a bookstore in the airport, and it sold these little travel-sized aspirin packets. I thought, well, it's way overpriced. It was way more money than I wanted to spend, but the package said it contained four aspirin and a drinking cup. Well, that was interesting to me. This little tiny package contained four aspirin and a drinking cup. So my head hurt enough, I shelled out the money and I bought the little package. Well, I wanna show you the drinking cup that came with the pills. It is a little tiny paper envelope with the word drinking cup written on the side. And it says right on the package here, another innovative idea for people on the go. Yeah, boy, that's a really innovative idea. I guess you're supposed to pour water in there and drink out of this drinking cup that I purchased for several dollars <laughs> along with the aspirin. I'm tired of getting sales pitches that are just trying to sell me stuff that really I don't need. I, I read about a department store that sells plain water in a small spray bottle for $5 a bottle. And the ads claim that this water is, quote, a handy source of refreshment for hot, dry skin. You know, actually God already gave us that. It's called sweat and it doesn't cost $5 a bottle. I agree with this psalm. Lord, save me from lying lips. Save me from deceitful tongues, from people who are just playing games with me. I am sick of dishonesty and manipulation and unnecessary conflict. This psalm goes on to say, I'm tired of living among people who hate peace. Doesn't that resonate with you right now? The psalmist says, I search for peace, but when I speak of peace, they want war. Maybe you can relate to that. The word in Hebrew for peace is the word shalom. It means peace in the widest sense. Health, success, well-being, spiritual wholeness, salvation, forgiveness. If you're tired of lies and conflict, I want to tell you one thing that will pick you up is to know that God will always be honest with you, even if it's hard truth that he has to tell you. He's always going to tell you the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, when life knocks you down, another thing to know about God is he's always available. Psalm 121 goes on and it begins by saying, I look up to the mountains. 
Does my help come from there? Now, you know, the mountains, again, are beautiful things. They're impressive. They lift up our vision and lift up our eyes. But does my help come from the mountains? Actually, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. As impressive as the mountains look, our help comes from the Lord who made the mountains. The problem is we're often not looking high enough for our help. Listen, if you think the next election will solve all our social problems, you're not looking high enough. If you think that a scientific breakthrough will fix everything that's wrong with our world, or if you think that a pay increase will solve all of your worries, you're not looking high enough. We need to look beyond the mountains to the Lord who made the mountains. And look what it says in verse 8 of this chapter. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. I really like that when it says that the Lord watches over your coming and your going. Now that's true on a daily basis. When you get up in the morning and you go to work or you go to school, God's going to be watching over you. And when you come home in the evening and you come back to your house or your apartment, God's watching over you then. In a bigger sense, he watches over your coming in life. When you launch a new career, when you move to a new home, when you start college, when you begin married life. And he watches over your going. When you graduate or when you retire, he is there when you're born. He's there when you die. Life may knock you down, but God is always available to help. He's watching over your coming and you're going throughout your life. Now, here's a third thing that we notice about God, a thir third truth that comforts us and encourages us in our journey with God. God cares about where you live. Now, let me unpack this one just a little bit from Psalm 122. God cares about where you live, whether you live in a mansion or in a shack. This chapter begins by saying, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are, standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Remember, the psalmist is part of a group of people who've been ascending up to Jerusalem to worship God. These are songs of ascent. The people are singing these songs as they climb the hills to go toward Jerusalem. And now they arrive at the gates of the city and they're thrilled to be there. They're grateful for a safe journey. They're overjoyed to be standing in the holy city. Now, sometimes we use this verse when we welcome people to worship here at Connection Point. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. If you're a person who thinks church is boring, I want you to know at Connection Point, we aspire to be a church where people are glad to go to the house of God, where it's not a torturous thing, but it's an exciting thing. It's actually a joy-producing thing to go and be with God's people. But you know, during the pandemic this year, church buildings have been closed for several weeks. You look, we've learned to look at our own apartments or houses and say, well, I'm glad to be at the house of the Lord, and this is the house of the Lord. God dwells there too. Now, of course, God is here in the church building at Connection Point, but he's also present and alive and well in your neighborhood, and he cares about that community where you live. Now, the psalm goes on, and it says, pray for peace in Jerusalem. Some translations say, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls. Now, to appreciate why Jerusalem was so important to the Jewish people, you have to understand it was the capital city for their nation. It was their oldest city. It was their biggest city. It was the center of their cultural and religious life. It was kind of like New York, London, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. all combined. And so the psalmist looks at this city and he says, for the sake of my family and my friends, for the sake of the loved ones that I care about, I'm going to say about this city, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. So I would say in light of passages like this, we even today should be praying for the peace of the Middle East. We should be praying for believers in the Messiah and the Lord Jesus who live in that difficult part of the world. But you know what? This passage also reminds me 
that we also need to think about our own neighborhoods and be praying for the peace of our own communities. Have you stopped to pray for the peace of Brownsburg? For the peace of Avon? For the peace of Speedway? For the peace of Indianapolis? Have we prayed enough that our neighbors will find the peace that only Christ can bring them? People in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities. We need these prayers. Indianapolis has had more murders this year than in any year in its history, and it's only October, folks. We need to be praying for our neighbors, pray for our government leaders, pray for public safety workers, for those who lead our schools and work in our hospitals. Pray that our homes will be places of peace filled with the glory of God because God cares about the place where we live. Now here's a fourth point, a fourth truth about God when life knocks you down. God's mercy is unshakable. God's mercy is unshakable. Psalm 123 says, Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy, for we've had our fill of contempt. You know, sometimes I watch the news and I just pray that, I say, Lord, have mercy. (laughs) And that's got to be more than just a little expression we use. That really needs to be the prayer of our heart. Lord, have mercy on our culture, on our country, on our community. And we also need to make it personal and just say, Lord, have mercy on me. I need God's mercy. Have you ever wished that you could just have a start over, a do over, and start over with a clean slate? I heard about a janitor who accidentally ran thousands of dollars worth of good checks through a paper shredder. And when he saw what he was doing and realized his mistake, he desperately tried to tape all the checks back together again. You just can't fix things sometimes when they're that torn up. We need the mercy of God to fix things that are unrepairable from our point of view. And we need this more than we might think. You know, you might look real snappy in that sweater you're wearing today, but I bet if you brush it in bright sunlight, it's amazing how much dust will fly up from it. We're not as clean and put together as we like to appear, as we like to think that we are. That's why we all need the mercy of God, for God to have mercy on us, have mercy. We've had our fill of contempt. When Jesus died on the cross, he displayed mercy. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was incredible mercy. Jesus told a story about a tax collector who went up to the temple to pray. And instead of being prideful about it when he prayed, he hit himself on the chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The apostle Peter wrote, it is by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's God's mercy that gives us the fresh start. It's God's mercy that gives us the clean slate. God's mercies, the Bible says, are new every morning. There is something freeing, incredibly refreshing about the mercy of God. Did you ever try to turn a nut on a bolt and you're twisting it the wrong way and you just have to turn it the other way and then it works right? It's actually a relief when you realize you've been going the wrong direction and when things turn around, it begins to go better. And that is the way it is when we receive the mercy of God and we're born again with a whole new fresh start because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm 125 verse 1. It says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. Now that's the hill. Mount Zion was the hill where Jerusalem was located. It was considered a solid, strong place. It was associated with the temple and the presence of God. Those who trust in the Lord are like that, like that mountain, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. You say, but wait a minute, I feel shaken a lot. Have you ever been through an earthquake? I've been through two, but they were both really small ones. I haven't been through the big ones like they have out in California or in Mexico. One day I was lying on the couch when I lived in Ohio, and I felt the couch shaking a little bit. It was unnerving. We had a little earthquake. When my family lived in New York, outside of New York City, one day we woke up in the morning and the windows were rattling. We were having a small earthquake. Even though they were minor earthquakes, it was very rattling to be shaken that way. Listen, there are other ways in life that we get shaken. Bad news can shake us up. An insensitive insensitive comment can upset us or unsettle us. One afternoon, I stepped out of my office and encountered a man in the lobby of the building where I worked. 
I was the only one there. We chatted a while. He needed directions. I gave him some directions, offered some help. Later that evening, I saw the same guy on the evening news on TV. He was wanted for armed robbery, which had occurred that same evening. Let me tell you, that shook me up. Maybe you've gotten a health diagnosis or a bit of family news that has shaken you up. A friend of mine was on a mission trip in Africa and he discovered a lump in his thigh. By the time he got home from the mission trip, the lump had grown larger. Soon he was fighting for his life and being treated for terminal cancer. I visited him in the hospital and when I walked into the room, he had a life-size cardboard cutout of the Three Stooges standing by his bed. He wanted everybody who came into the room to visit him, but also to sign his cardboard cutout of the Three Stooges. He just thought that was funny because even though life had knocked him down, his relationship with the Lord was strong and the joy that he had in the Lord was still strong because this man understood the mercy of God was still with him. He was unshakable because God's mercy is unshakable. Psalm 125 goes on and gives us another illustration of this. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Now, I love the thought of this because it's basically saying God has you surrounded. It's kind of like in basketball when two defenders converge on a guy who has the ball and they just surround him so they trap him, you know, so that he can't get out and can't dribble away. It's like the old TV shows where the police would come and catch the bank robber and they would surround him and say, come out with your hands up, we've got you surrounded. What an interesting thing to think that we are surrounded by the Lord. Now, I have to tell you, I think that's been true of me in my life. God's had me surrounded even when I didn't recognize his presence. He's been there. When I was born, when I was a baby, he was the one who gave me life. When I was a young boy, he was the one who kept my older brothers from killing me. When I was a teenager, God put into my life people who loved me and guided me in a way so my faith would grow. I'm so thankful for that. When I became a father, he was the one who put those precious children into my arms, even though I'd never even changed a diaper before. The Lord's had me surrounded. And he's got you surrounded too. If you open your eyes, you might be surprised where you keep bumping into him everywhere you go. I've bumped into the Lord in hospitals and schools and funeral homes and on farms. I've bumped into him in other countries where I've worshipped him with people who didn't even speak the same language that I do. God's got you surrounded. His mercy is great. His mercy is unshakable. Now here's a fifth thing about God to remember when life knocks you down. He replaces tears with joy. Psalm 126 says, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Now, this is kind of an interesting concept. Why would a farmer cry when he goes out to plant his seed? You know, my dad was a farmer. I never once remember him starting to cry. Oh, I got to go out to plant corn. And he would start to cry. No, I don't ever remember that. Why would the farmer in biblical times go out and plant in tears? Well, you have to understand, in Bible times, food was in short supply, especially by the end of the winter when your family had eaten most of the grain you had stored up. The farmer only had so much seed So he had to make a tough choice. Do you go ahead and eat the grain that you have, precious as it is? Or do you plant that precious seed so that you can enjoy a bigger harvest months from now? This was a harder thing than you might think. They couldn't just go down to the store and buy more food. So it may be that the farmer is shedding tears because there's a part of him that would like to feed his family right now. And instead, he has to trust God to multiply the seed that he's planting and to provide for his family in the long run. You know, planting a field is an act of faith. It's an investment in the future. But the farmer knows that the end result will be joy when you bring in the harvest. So it says that those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. Right now, you may be planting in tears. You may be going through a season in your life when the tears are flowing because your job is tough, 
being a parent is proving to be very hard work. I want to encourage you to keep planting, even if you have to do it in tears, trusting that eventually, as the Bible says, if we don't give up, we will reap a harvest in due time if we do not give up, and there will be shouts of joy then. Keep living by faith. Eventually the harvest will come and there will be joy again. Now another truth to remember about God when life knocks you down is he cares about your family. Psalms 127 and 128 remind us of this. I want to show you a photo of my family. This is my group, my wife, my my uh, daughters, my son, my sons-in-law, my grandchildren, even my dog, Nugget, has made it into the picture. I cannot put into words how much I love the people in this picture. I love my family dearly. But you know what? If we told you our family's whole story, it would include a life-threatening battle with cancer, the sadness of a miscarriage, a lifetime of dealing with a disability, an incredible amount of job stress, and many, many other challenges that we have faced together and individually. I cannot imagine trying to raise a family in today's world without God's help. That's why Psalm 127 begins by saying, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, you're really tackling something that's beyond your capacity to do without God's help. Now, Psalm 127 goes on and it says that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. And I just want to say that this is true for all of us in the way that we need to look at children. Maybe you're Children came to you biologically or by adoption. Maybe you have foster children. Maybe you haven't been blessed to be a parent in those ways. But in the church, in the Lord, we all have a responsibility to children, to be spiritual moms and dads, aunts and uncles. What about the kids in our neighborhoods? Do we realize that they're a gift from the Lord too? They're a reward from God. Psalm 128 goes on and it says, Your wife will be like a fruitful grapevine flourishing within your home. Your children will be like vigorous young olive trees as they sit around your table. That is the Lord's blessing for those who fear Him. I remember finding that verse when my kids were young and telling them, You guys are like olive trees around my table. And they thought that was the weirdest illustration of all. But if you were an ancient Israelite, you would have loved that story because an olive tree was a very valued thing. And you know what? An olive tree, an olive tree, you plant a young olive tree seedling and it takes about 15 years for it to grow to the point where it starts to bear fruit. And so it's actually a great picture of something of high value and something that takes some time to develop as your children grow up and as you raise them in the Lord. All of this is just to say, dads and moms and grandpas and grandmas, aunts and uncles, listen, the time that you spend with your children is precious. Those of you who serve here at Connection Point and work with kids in Kids City, the time that you are giving them, the love that you are giving them, the sacrifices you are making, your consistent presence with them, your presence with your little ones in your home. It may make you tired sometimes, but it is a powerful, incredible, valuable investment in the next generation. First Lady Barbara Bush was right. She said, our success as a society depends not on what happens in the White House, but on what happens in your house in your house. That's why one of the visionary goals that Pastor John talks about, in fact, it's written on the walls of the church building here at Connection Point, is to raise up the next generation to be the strongest generation and to help them grow in their faith. God cares about your family. And then a seventh truth about God to remember when life knocks you down is this. Eventually, God has a way of turning darkness into light. Now the key word here is eventually, because he doesn't always do it as quickly as we would like. 
Psalm 130 uses the word wait over and over again. It says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Now, waiting is hard, isn't it? When I was a boy, I could hardly wait for Christmas morning to come, for the beginning of the basketball season to come. As an adult, I hate waiting. I hate waiting in lines. I hate waiting for red lights to turn green. At the doctor's office, they make me sit in the waiting room, and then once they, are, uh, they come and call my name, it's time to go to another waiting room and still wait for the doctor. I don't like to wait. Even with the Lord, I don't like to wait. When I pray for something to change, and nothing happens right away, I grow very impatient. But listen, God's blessings are worth the wait. Now, the Psalms are poetry, and one poetic device is to repeat, to use repetition. So this isn't a misprint. In the, the, the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. And then he says it again, more than watchmen wait for the morning. I have a friend who was stationed in the army uh, during Desert Storm, and he pulled guard duty during the night, and he told me that he often read his Bible to pass the time. One night he read from Psalm 130, and these verses seemed written especially for him because he knew what it felt like to wait for the morning when you're waiting through the long night. Now, you may not be a night watchman or somebody, a soldier on guard duty, but maybe you know how it feels to go through a long, hard night when the hours drag by and you cannot wait for morning to arrive. You may be in a situation like that right now. Maybe you've been sick, tossing and turning in bed during the night. Or maybe you wake up in the middle of the night fretting about something, filled with anxious thoughts. Worries sometimes seem more intense at 3 a.m. I feel for truck drivers who are out on the highways during the wee hours of the morning while most of us are in bed. My wife is a registered nurse. She, for a series of years in her career, worked the night shift in the hospital taking care of patients. Those nights can be a long, hard thing to get through. Moms and dads who sit up through the night rocking a sick child know how this feels. Think of Jesus on the dark night before he died, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane with his face to the ground. So there are long, dark nights, and you might be going through one of them right now. The final song in the Psalms of Ascents, Psalm 134, says this. Oh, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You who do what? You who serve at night in the house of the Lord. You who serve at night. This was probably initially talking about the priests of God who served in the temple. You know, after all the sacrifices had been made and all the work was done during the day, somebody had to stick around and do the dirty work through the night to make sure things were ready for the next day. Somebody had to stick around when the noisy crowds were gone and the voices of the rabbis were silent and the music and the singing had faded into the night. No more children playing, no more old men praying aloud, no more merchants and money changers hawking their business. Somebody had to stick around and keep the fire going on the altar. Somebody had to clean up the ashes from yesterday's sacrifice. Somebody had to make sure that things were ready for tomorrow. Somebody had to serve through the night when everybody else had left and everybody else was resting. Maybe right now you're one of those people who's having to serve through the night. Maybe this is a dark time for you, for people you care about. And you feel the weight of responsibility because others are counting on you to serve through the darkness. You feel the weight of responsibility on your shoulders. Maybe this is a dark time for you. Maybe somebody has let you down. Maybe somebody you trusted has stabbed you in the back. Maybe you set a goal for this year and you haven't even begun to reach it. Maybe life has really knocked you down. Well, let me tell you, God has a way of turning darkness into light. And the Lord will see you through this dark night that you are in. In fact, he may even help you to find a way to minister to others and serve through the night. I can tell you this for sure. The darkness will not last forever. There's another great verse in the Psalms. 
Psalm 30, verse 5, that says, Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. It's really true. You know, my son Matt was born with cerebral palsy. It affects his right side, so he walks with a limp. Matt is an adult now. He has a jail ministry. It's part of what he does as a minister of the gospel. He meets with inmates for Bible study one-on-one. A lot of these guys are really rough characters, tough guys, but they like Matt, and when he comes around, it kind of lightens the load for them because he has a unique sense of humor. So along with very serious one-on-one Bible studies that he does with the inmates, he also makes them laugh and brings some lightness and some joy to their time that they're spending in jail. Matt has told me, and I have his permission to say this, he says he feels inadequate when he walks through the corridors of the jail because he's working with some really tough guys. They're physically strong and all. And he sees himself on the security cameras as he walks with his awkward limp. And he thinks, who am I to reach these inmates? Who am I to minister to them? But he goes. Faithfully, he goes. One time, he met with an inmate accused of murder who was later convicted of the crime. And when their Bible study was over, as Matt stood up to leave, he tripped and was about to fall. The inmate quickly reached out his hand and caught Matt and lifted him up. And Matt told us later, Dad, wow, the very hand that had committed murder reached out and kept me from falling. Sometimes God uses circumstances or people that we least expect to lift us up. Today I want to tell you, as these psalms have helped us see, if life has knocked you down, you just can't give up. you got to keep climbing. Let's pray. Lord, life has a way of knocking all of us down. I want to pray specifically today for the person who's really been beaten down lately who has needed the words of encouragement that we've discovered in these songs of ascent. Lord, I thank you and I praise you that you are a God who has us surrounded. That even when we feel like we're alone and you are far from us, you are actually right there. And if we will open our eyes, we'll just keep bumping into you everywhere we look. Help us, Lord, to live in the light of your glory, even in the midst of dark days and dark nights. When you've called us to be the ones, Lord, that stay up during the dark night, still serving to help other people, give us the strength that we need. Lord, when we are tired, give us renewed energy. When our faith is weak, make it strong. Give us boldness and courage. Give us perseverance. Lord, do not let us give up. Let us keep climbing. Let us keep following you in that upward call of God. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus who climbed the hill of Calvary to die for our sins and then rose up from the dead. Amen.